Uh, good morning, Sean. How feasible is it that the attacks were unknowingly going to hit aid workers? Good morning, Nicola. Good morning, David. Yeah, I mean, I think it's worth setting a bit of context here. Um, you know, trying to get the aid, there's no shortage of international aid trying to get into Gaza, but it's being blocked in a way by the Israels at the border. As a result, the uh, maritime routes being open, coming in from Cyprus, and what the World Central Kitchen was doing was running aid convoys, delivering that aid out. Now, we initially understood that this attack was done onto an aid convoy. It subsequently turned out that was not the case. It was actually some of the uh, seven of the, or six of the aid workers and their driver heading home at the end of the shift. So they were leaving central Gaza. They were following a coastal route down to Rafa. Um, and that's when this, uh, it's, this strike happened, killing the um, three Brits, uh, John Chapman, James Henderson and James Kirby and their driver. Um, on their way back. Now, at night time, of course, their uniforms wouldn't have been seen. At night times, it would have been a lot more difficult to see the logos. But the evidence, interestingly, suggests that the vehicles were not conducted, not attacked by one strike, but actually three separate strikes, which is interesting. The cars were spread across two and a half kilometres of road. Uh, and it looks like the first vehicle was struck and uh, destroyed. It was an armoured vehicle. The second one um, it was probably survivable as well, the attack. But the third vehicle was about two and a half kilometres further south, utterly destroyed. And the report suggests that all the um, casualties were from inside one car. So there's clearly been a systematic attack on this convoy, um, leading to the tragic deaths of these uh, three Brits and the other uh, um, occupants of the car. And as you can see, those pictures are horrifying. So the missile strike into that car. And you can see the logo there of the World uh, Central Kitchen as well. In terms of the international response here, Rishi Sunak is appalled by the killing of three British citizens. He described the situation as intolerable. We've heard David Cameron, the Foreign Secretary, saying the deaths are unacceptable. We've heard Joe Biden as well also strongly, uh, strongly criticising this, sharply criticising this and saying uh, that, I that Israel has not done enough to protect citizens. When you look at Israel's response, they say, well, look, it was a mistake. It shouldn't have happened. And we are looking into it. We will do everything we can to ensure it does not happen again. That's not good enough. No, I agree, David. I mean, again, just in the sense of balance, I spent two years of my life serving in Afghanistan, and, and aid was one of the things that we tried to support there as well. And it's it's an interesting relationship between the military and the aid organisations because the simplest way of providing aid is putting aid trucks in a convoy. You put a military vehicle at the front, military vehicle at the back, they've got secure communications, electronic means, and you pretty much guarantee the aid workers won't be struck. The trouble is most aid workers don't want to have a close relationship with the military around. That does not help them with their task of helping um, the locals. And therefore, there's always this slightly difficult situation. But but playing to your point, um, what, what's interesting, we are making news today because of these three British workers, aid workers that are guide, that providing the security military we understand but it does highlight there's over 196 palestinian aid workers that have been killed over the last six months 196 this is not just an accident as you've suggested unfortunately what uh, israel's made no secret of the fact that it's trying to it did said it not um it does not want aid to flow into the hands of hamas and therefore it's being somewhat um difficult about allowing access and the danger is when these strikes happen it does point the finger of of blame potentially at the Israelis who should be doing more to ensure that the aid's getting through to what is an escalating humanitarian crisis in Gaza. And that's exactly what the ICJ ruling said on the 29th of March. Israel must act without delay to allow aid into Gaza. Now, clearly they've been told there that we had the resolution, the UN Security Council resolution passed as well. Also, what do you make of this analysis or the legal advice? This is Alicia Kearns, the chair of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee, saying the UK government has already already been given legal advice that Israel has broken humanitarian law but has not announced it. And the reason being is that we are still selling arms to Israel. Yeah, I mean, David, I don't want to get involved in conjecture. I'm not a legal expert. What I would say is that uh, under international law, uh, it's illegal to provide weapons to any nation where you know they're going to be used in violation of international law. 
And there are several countries there are, uh, that have actually stopped supplying uh, weapons to um, the Israelis. Uh, I, I read the other day that the Netherlands has stopped providing spare parts for the Joint Strike Fighter to try and stop them using those for airstrikes. What you have to remember, though, is the U.S. supplies over 70 percent of the weapons uh, to the Israelis. And uh, things like the Joint Strike Fighter, the, the Americans operate the biggest single fleet of those aircraft. So they can definitely fill in the gaps. I think the challenge, as you say, though, is that the pressure is mounting at the moment on Israel, um, particularly with the casualty figures well over 100,000. And I, and I hope we're seeing progress now with the negotiations in Cairo, with the Ramadan coming to the end, expects to be on the 9th of April. There is some hope that uh, those negoti negotiations will bear fruit, because if they don't, the tens of thousands of protesters in Tel Aviv, Israel's own people, calling that more needs to be done to get those hostages out and calling for an end to this brutal war. Uh, that seems to be pressure piling up on Prime Minister Netanyahu. Uh, Sean, appreciate that you're not a lawyer, but you are a mi military uh, analyst. What do you make of the Israeli newspaper Haaretz's report over the weekend that IDF officers on the ground essentially do what they want? We spoke to a former IDF soldier earlier on in the show. You might have heard a clip of him briefly before we, we spoke to you, saying that there are actually designated kill zones within Gaza, whereby IDF soldiers are ordered to uh, shoot and kill anyone who enters that zone, as long as they're not an IDF soldier, regardless of whether they're an innocent civilian or a Hamas fighter. It's very difficult, isn't it, when you take a dip test of one individual. What I would say is that uh, Israel is a fairly professional force. One of the challenges they've got is they've recently mobilised, you know, 300,000 people who won't have had a great deal of military experience. And you're asking them to operate in a war zone where their lives are under threat. And it's a very dynamic situation. That does not excuse unprofessional behaviour. It does not excuse some of the carnage we're seeing. But it's very difficult to comment on reports like that. What I would say is that inevitably the the, the proof of the pudding is that as a military guy, there is no military solution to what is going on in Gaza. This will not make Israel safer, even when you take out the last four battalions of Hamas. Um, will the legacy of this brutal uh, war mean that Israel is safer in the future? I, I find it very hard to imagine that's true. The challenge will be the international community stepping up once the conflict is over to try and make sure that there's a lasting peace, the lasting prosperity of both sides, lasting hope for both sides. Otherwise, we're going to rinse and repeat this in the coming decades. But, Sean, it's not just the testimony of, of one individual. I appreciate your point. You know, there's reports here in newspapers, doctors saying that children have been targeted by Israeli snipers. Surely that is proof, if ever you needed it, of breaking humanitarian law. Why are the UK not coming down harder on Israel? Well, part of, Nicola, you're absolutely right. One of the issues about international law, and particularly war crimes, is that um, they have to be properly investigated. The news can't, news um, and media can't be judge, jury, and uh, prosecutor in all of this. Um, there is a lot of information being collected now, and if war crimes have been committed, those that have committed them will be brought to justice. War, unfortunately, is a horrendous uh, um, activity. I've been involved, unfortunately, in a couple in my time, and it's just brutal. It's horrible. And um, But luckily, um, we seem to be drawing this one to an end, and I truly hope that the international community will collect all the information available and make sure that anybody who has been perpetrating war crimes is brought to account as they deserve to be.